Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last Tuesday of the month. This is the CodeCast Podcast. My name is Terry Fletcher, and that means that this is Top 10 Tuesday, meaning that I've gathered the the top questions that I've received, both coding, billing, reimbursement, compliance, management, you name it, uh, over the last month. And actually, it'll be two months since we didn't have an opportunity to do Top 10 Tuesday last month due to the breaking news from Medicare. And so uh, we have a mixed bag today, and I'm excited to bring those to you. First, we'd like to thank Create Nation leading source of daily inspiration and information for creative thinkers, innovators, artists, and entrepreneurs. Um, Therefore, out of Boulder, Colorado, createnation.org. Okay, so what we want to talk about when we look at some of the questions, and like I said, I've had a mixed bag, so they're all over the place. So the first one has to do with coding for ankle fractures, uh, specifically fibula fractures. So our the question is, Terry, our orthopedist performed a three-view ankle x-ray uh, for a left displaced lateral malalias uh, fracture in addition to a two-view x-ray for a left upper end fibular fracture. Uh, it was the first time our practice saw the patient for these injuries. Uh, should I append both the diagnosis code to both procedures? Okay, so this is a good question because you never know what you're supposed to do there. So in your example, you should not designate both diagnoses codes for both procedures, despite the fact that the fractures are within close proximity to one another. Um, but just as with just as what you would do if the provider performs x-rays on the entire uh, separate anatomic site, so left leg versus uh, right leg, you would only apply the diagnosis relevant to each respective scan. This remains true even if the provider images and documents both diagnoses on both x-rays. So for a three-view ankle x-ray of the left displaced lateral meliolus fracture, you would apply code 73610. That's a radiological exam, ankle complete, minimum of three views. For the two-view x-ray of the left proximal fibular fracture, you would apply code 73590, a radiological examination, TIB, fib two views. If the payer requires it, you might also need to append a modifier, which is the two-digit code at the end, left side LT, to both of those codes. So as for diagnoses, you will attach the S as in SAM 82.62X as in X-ray A, because it's the initial encounter, displaced fracture of lateral malleolus of the left tibia, initial encounter for closed fracture. That's to the 73610 code. You would then attach S82.832A, other fracture of the upper and lower end of the fibula, initial encounter for the closed fracture, to the 73590. So I know some of you that are not orthopedic, you're probably like, boy, I'm really glad somebody asked that question, but I know it's a little bit um, daunting sometimes when you hear some of the coding questions, but we try to serve every specialty if we can, uh, at least the specialties that I am versed in. And I, I'm versed in 10, so we do our best to hit everything. If there's actually not a specialty that you've heard, please hit me up. Let me know. Send me an email, uh, Terry Fletcher CPC at AOL.com. I'm more than happy to address a question, even if it didn't come from my coding corner on demand clients. So question number two, I actually like this question because this comes up and this is generic to any specialty that's out there. And this is about the 99211 nurse visit code. So somebody said something to the effect of, you know, I want to bill a nurse visit code just, you know, because our uh, nurse or a medical assistant had an encounter with the patient. I said, okay, well, let's take a look at that encounter and really look and see what it means. Because to report a 99211, a practitioner must perform an ENM service. So in other words, it's not a catch-all code that you can report every time a patient passes through your practice. So an example here, somebody said, so Terry, a nurse speaks to a patient on the phone and agrees to obtain a prescription refill for her. The patient agrees uh, to come to the practice an hour later, and the nurse hands her a prescription through the reception window. Okay, so can we code for that? No, because the nurse did not evaluate the patient and no medical necessity required that she meet with her, you should not report an office visit. If the nurse couldn't renew the patient's prescription without evaluating her, 
then she should have documented a medical necessity office visit and saw the patient. So you have to actually see the patient and have some kind of um, documentation that reflects an E&M service. So, you know, some um, payers are very clear about this. They want to know the reason for the visit, uh, you know, a brief or at least interim history, what's going on with the patient, any kind of min minimal pertinent exam, vital signs are commonly expected by certain payer contractors uh, in the notes of uh, any audit notes that I see. And then just a brief statement. So no complications or prescriptions being used pr properly, refill provided is good practice. So just making sure that you address any of those concerns and it is part of the patient's uh, medical record, then you could bill it. But just for a phone call, come and pick up a script prescription, that would be frowned upon. Next question, um, and this is about a debridement. So this is derm and a little bit of orthopedic, but mostly derm. During the course of, a, of treating a patient who is in an automobile accident, our orthopedist had to perform extensive debridement as well as several other procedures. What I'm wondering about is how the code of debridement or how to code the debridement. So the notes indicate that the provider performed debridement subcutaneous tissue, 39 square centimeters total. Can you help me select a code? Okay, so first of all, I always ask that you double check with the provider before coding. But based on the notes that you have and what you gave me, um, first of all, you're going to choose the subcutaneous debridement codes that start at 11042. And that code basically says debridement subcutaneous tissue includes epidermis and dermis if performed first 20 square centimeters or less. So now you can see that you have to have that kind of measurement within the record. And that's for the first 20 centimeters of debridement. And then I would use the add-on code 11045, and that's for each additional 20 square centimeters or part thereof. And it says list in addition to the code for the primary procedure. So it's an add-on code, so you don't need a modifier. And that's for the remaining 19 centimeters. So the notes indicate that the debridement went past the epidermis and dermis down to the sub tissue. So this appears to be the correct code. But if the provider actually debrided past the sub tissue, you might want to choose one from the higher paying codes because it talks about it's going further down into the patient's body. And so always make sure you're, you're double checking with your provider, especially if they're not one to understand coding and how you have to not only have the square centimeters, but you have to have specifics when it comes to how far you're debriding on that patient. Next question. So for ICD-10, this is question four, coding purposes, what is the difference between an unclassified pathological and recurrent wrist dislocation? Would you include would you code these injuries with the same diagnosis? So the injuries are different and they're classified different in the ICD-10 codes. So a pathological dislocation, when you're looking at that, that occurs when the wrist bones are out of their normal position as a some, uh, consequence of the disease. For an unclassified pathological dislocation, you would be somewhere around the M24.331 codes to M24.339, just depending on the encounter specifics. And you may need a, a separate, uh, an additional digit, I should say, um, to tell the encounter. Recurrent dislocation, on the other hand, this is re a repeated displacement of the bones from normal alignment because of a traumatic or non-traumatic event. So previous injury, repetitive motion, joint looseness, anything like that. So for an unclassified recurrent dislocation, you choose from the codes that are starting with M24.431 to M24.439. Remember, you need to make sure you're checking and double checking your encounter notes. Include laterality which talks about the right and or left side of the body and make sure that um, you, you are also adding the right amount of digits. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have a problem um, having the correct diagnosis on that. So now we're going to move to a question that comes from what we were talking about with some of the new updates from Medicare. And I actually have kind of laughed at this question because I agree, somebody listened into the podcast and said, you're not serious, are you? Well, unfortunately, yes, I I'm serious. So here's what somebody said. They said, Terry, I listened to your podcast and I just read something in a Part B news article and it says that CMS is proposing to flatten payments for office encounters suggesting a single rate for established office codes and a single rate for new patient visits. Is this accurate? I, I just can't imagine that this is accurate. Yes, this is accurate. The compressed payment structure, which could take effect as early as January 1st, would impact hundreds of millions of EM encounters 
and be part of this CMS proposal to tie up level two through five's co five codes for reporting purposes. And it gets better. So the federal agency basically said that level one codes, new patient would be $44, level one nurse visit would be 24. But instead of adopting a new code set, the agency is attaching the same RVUs, which are relative value units, to the level two through five codes, which creates the same payment amount. Much of the change will impact utilization patterns of established office codes 99213 to 214, which comprised 89% of allowed charges for the whole established patient series in 2016. So specifically code 99214 would face a 16 or about a 15% pay cut under their proposal accounted for 50% 50 per, 50 of allowable charges among those codes in 2016. So this is a huge windfall for Medicare. On the new patient codes, 99203 and 204 comprise 32% and 44% respectively of allowable charges in 2016. So practices billing the new rate for 99204 would see a 13% dis decrease in pay. Um, now the 203 does get a gain, but the problem here isn't just the, the one payment system. The problem is the fact that if a patient comes in and needs to be worked up as a level five patient with systemic issues and chronic conditions and, you know, basically a train wreck, you ha still have to work them up because of malpractice and because of best practices when it comes to documentation. But you're still only going to get paid as if it was a level two patient. And Medicare seems to think, oh, no, you only have to document as a level two well, that might work for them, but that's not going to work for some commercial plans or for some physicians that may need to look at your record. And also, it's it's going to hurt you from a, from a compliance standpoint. The other thing is that Medicare also put out something, and this isn't part of the question, but you need to know this. They want to do that 50% reduction on the 25 modifier. So you take these reductions already, and let's say you had a patient that was a level four new patient visit, and you're already taking a 13% decrease. Okay, so about a $26 decrease. And then you also did a minor procedure that day. Let's say you moved a skin tag or a lipoma or you did a joint injection, something that was a minor procedure. Or even let's say that you did something in your office that was, you know, maybe a, a breast biopsy or something. They're going to reduce again your office visit by another 50% if you put a 25 modifier on it, which you would need to to protect it from uh, denial when it's built on the same date as a minor service. So not only are you getting the reduction with the one uh, payment system uh, or adopting the, you know, the one RVU to it doesn't matter what you code for, but you're also going to get reduced if you provide it on the same date as a minor procedure. Now, I know they've also had grumblings of, you know, G codes for time, but here's the kicker on the G code for time. Basically, it says 30 minutes. It doesn't say like prolonged service codes in the CPT book that says up to 30 minutes. It says 30 minutes flat. So if you're spending, you know, let's say you're doing the 99204, uh, which has a 40 minute threshold on it, you would have to basically then add 30 minutes to that and document it to be able to get your visit. So you're looking at what, 70 minutes there? Who spends an hour and 10 minutes with a patient nowadays? And so you're, you're basically, it, it's just a system that's really a problem please make sure you're commenting on this. Otherwise, if you don't, it, it just, there's only been 2,600 um, comments so far of all the physicians, staff, patients, anybody can comment. It's not just for providers. It says stakeholders. Everybody's a stakeholder. And if you're a staff listening to this, you're a stakeholder too. If this changes and the physician's income goes down, I could see the physicians moving into computer uh, coding and so CAC, so basic computer assisted coding versus using live staff. So, and subbing everything out and outsourcing. So everybody needs to get on board here and really read what the guidelines say and understand it. Go back and listen to my breaking news story. It was back in the last Tuesday of July and really pay attention to it and really go up and you can see it on my website how to access. So that's, you can tell I'm, I'm pretty hot about that. Which brings us to question six about the 30 minutes. And actually, I kind of answered it already. But that is one of the things. They're changing it from the 99354. I should say they're adding one. Hixpix code, which the uh, proposal is the GPR01. But they're just saying beyond the typical service time uh, requiring patient contact uh, beyond 
the usual service. And it just says flat 30 minutes, and it's hard to actually hit that that threshold. There's another thing where they're talking about, well, we're going to give them an add-on code for um, for practice expense. It's $5. Yes, it's $5. So when they say stuff like that, you just sit there and go, okay, it's $5. So here we're going to get into question number seven. But before we do that, I want to thank Health Tech Magazine at Twitter, HT Magazines. Uh, Health Tech Magazine serves as the leading source of information for forward thinking professionals involved in healthcare. HealthTechMagazine.com. Okay, so our question seven comes as a place of service code. And I like this question, it's come up a couple times. So it says, Terry, our practice is considering opening up an ASC, which is an ambulatory surgery center for our heart caths. And I went, oh, wait, wait, wait. (laughs) So they're in California. And in California, you have to be careful because you can't open a cath lab by yourself. You have to be partly hospital owned. And so it's different than in Texas or in Pennsylvania or Florida where who have uh, independent freestanding facility availability. But that's a little bit different in California. You have to know your state. But also an ambulatory surgery center isn't always allowed for a cath lab. There's some pairs that I know that actually want you not to use the place of service 24. They want you to use the place of service 49 and that's for an independent clinic. What that reads is a location not part of the hospital and not described by any other place of service code that is organized and operated to provide preventative, diagnostic, therapeutic, rehabilitative, or palliative services to patients only. So what I would recommend is make sure you check out what the payer wants and if they'll even allow it first before you get into that. Um, I've seen practices that jump right into saying, oh, we're going to open up an ASC, and then they find out they can't get paid. And that can be an issue. So we definitely don't want to do that. Um, Otherwise, that can be very costly to your practice. Okay, so question eight. A question came up about violations and matters of uh, data breach and penalties. So it said, are penalties for violating the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, so HIPAA, um, all equal or accidental breaches taken into consideration? So a few years back, the HIPAA omnibus final rule introduced a solidified um, a new penalty structure, as well as new definitions relating to HIPAA violations. So the definitions for three terms in particular are really pivotal under the system. So the three terms are reasonable cause, an act or omission in which a covered entity or business associate knew or by exercising reasonable diligence would have known that the act or omission violated an administrative simplification provision, but in which the covered entity or business associate did not act with willful neglect. So intent is a big key here. Number two says it's reasonable diligence, business care and prudence expected from a person seeking to satisfy a legal requirement under similar similar circumstances or willful neglect, this one you don't want, conscious intentional failure or reckless indifference to the obligation to comply with the administrative simplification provision violated. And when you're destroying records, that's one of them. So make sure that you're destroying. We talked about this when it came to uh, one of the things we talked about before with, with HIPAA. So just make sure you're understanding some of those rules. Question nine. So here's one that this isn't a coding question, but I think this is kind of a fun question to talk about. So question says, so Terry, I know we're part of your coding corner and this might seem just so far out in left field. We don't know if you can even answer the question, but you've come to our office before, helped us with management. And so can you just give us your opinion? We, we respect your opinion and just curious what you think on this. So it says, I've noticed a lot more people seem to have food allergies. What do I do as a practice manager? Um, do I need to accommodate any, you know, any employee allergies and help everyone feel safe and welcome? Um, I really want to be that person that can do that. But I think sometimes it's really hard to be that person. So here's what I would do. And this is something that I just think, you know, I've written a blog on this and I just think it's something to really help, um, office kind of how everybody feels about everybody else there without having an antagonistic or, you know, hostile environment. So first of all, make questions about food allergies part of your hiring protocols. So you don't need to ask while you're interviewing people that can be construed as discrimination, depending on the prospective employee's answer. Instead, make it a regular question as you're orienting new hires. I wouldn't ask casually, as you're pointing out the employee break room and kitchenette, uh, ask about food allergies. I would ask it in writing so you have the answers in writing too. And then I would keep all of your team's food allergies in one place and always keep that word team. We're just making sure we have team updated information. 
Uh, if you're ordering in for a, a staff lunch or maybe a pharmaceutical company is bringing in a lunch, as you know they do, or even planning a, a team holiday party, have any kind uh, of all food allergies easily accessible and in one place and it'll make much more likely that you'll be able to accommodate everyone successfully. As all medical professionals know, food allergies can constitute an emergency, not simply just a nuisance. And having the information at hand will make any extracurricular planning uh, more comprehensive and easier. And remind employees to update you if they develop a new or different food allergy and est establish a protocol for asking for and recording those updates. The reason I say this is because, and I know not everything is harmony in an office when there's differences, but food allergies can develop at any point in life and seem to be increasing in frequency. So make sure your employees are willing and able to update you so you can do all you can to keep the office safe and not accidentally alienate any particular employee. Other thing I would also make sure you do, which has been the cause of some some, um, a lot of problems lately with people getting sick and things, ask your staff and say every night you need to clean off your cell phone. So make sure you clean off your cell phone, you wipe down your desk and have um, the antibacterial wipes so they can wipe down their phones. I know that cleaning people come in every once in a while, but they don't always wipe down phones and receivers. And we still have those in the office. Um, but cell phones are big. People take their cell phones in the bathroom. People take them everywhere. And you just don't know where they've been. So I can't stress that enough to make sure that that is something that you're doing and not bringing it back into the practice because germs linger. They love to linger in places that you'd least expect it. Okay, so then our last question has to do with anemia. So this was something that anemia associated with malignancy. Remember how we keep talking about those default codes in ICD-10? And so according to the 2018 official guidelines for coding and reporting, again, ICD-10-CM, when the reason for the encounter is to manage anemia associated with a malignancy and the treatment is only for anemia, the appropriate code for the malignancy is sequenced first, followed by the appropriate code for anemia. So here's an example. This is the question. Terry, 47-year-old female patient with a diagnosis of lung cancer presents to her oncologist reporting excessive fatigue and decreased tolerance to exercise. A lab test performed by the oncologist determined the patient has anemia due to lung cancer. How do I code for this? Okay, so remember, when the reason for the encounter is to manage anemia caused by the malignancy, the malignancy code first, C34.90, malignant neoplasm of unspecified part of unspecified bronchus or lung, and then also the D63.0 code for anemia and neoplastic disease. You just want to make sure your sequencing is correct so that you can show the weighted situation uh, for the payer. So that is our top 10 Tuesday for today, top questions that we've had come in. I want to thank Keck Medicine of USC, 500 plus internationally renowned doctors at a leading academic medical center, keeping you healthy, on track, and doing the things you love. The Keck Effect, keckmedicine.org. So thank you everyone today for joining us. We're really excited that you're here. Next week, I'm going to get into some more HIPAA things, but it has to do with some of the virtual voice assistants. So there's some things out there that I think have shocked me, um, but there are just some things that have come up and you need to be aware of it. So we just want to make sure we put that out there. Also, make sure you're on the lookout, uh, not only for the CodeCast podcast, but uh, my personal, um, co I'm a co-host of a podcast where it's for professional moms and my uh, my partner in crime there, uh, Corinne Briley, we actually try to give you a comical look at, we call it the bun life, at life, family, kids, husbands, partners, spouses, everything, and just everything that's going on in life. So uh, between public school offering, between people not putting the toilet paper on the rack, that's all I'm saying, um, to you name it, it's out there. So uh, take a look, listen in, and uh, we have some good things out there. So I uh, hope to have everybody uh, on track. And as always, make it a great day. Thanks for listening. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music.